thank you very much. And uh, good evening. Well, it's exactly 10 years since the Centers for Disease Control in the United States first identified the AIDS virus. That was June 1981. It turned up in Australia the following year. Since then, 1,200 Australians have died. And there are at least 18,000 now with the HIV infection. The World Health Organization says there are 8 to 10 million worldwide. In Africa, two out of every 10 babies is born with it. One of the problems we're now living with is that in the early stages, Western countries completely underestimated the implications of AIDS. It was uh, dismissed as a, a gay plague with little or no relevance to the rest of the community. Well, now, of course, uh, we know they were wrong, as any one of you here, I'm sure, could testify. Everyone here tonight either has AIDS or is HIV positive or is close to somebody who is. And these people have to deal with the public fear, the ignorance and the prejudice that's still associated with this disease even after 10 years. Now, as far as I'm aware, this is the first time so many Australians with AIDS have been prepared to come and talk openly and frankly about their condition. But there are many, many others who still dare not for fear of the consequences that they'll suffer. We'll talk about that tonight. Jane Maloney, I'm interested in your story because I think probably you're part of the new wave of infections that the doctors believe they now have to deal with. Just, just tell us a little bit about how you got infected. I mean, I know it's a long story, but just, just, just take it in steps. John, I'm a drug user. He infected me and I infected my son. Mm. He's got it at the moment. You were living with this man in, yes. a, in a stable relationship. Yes. Did he know he was HIV positive, that yes, he was infectious? he did. He did? Yeah. But he never told you, obviously? No. Nope. I didn't know until I was pregnant again. When I went for so my you have one child, and you still had no idea that uh, you might have become HIV positive, that your child might be HIV positive? No, I didn't. Because I had one before my son, and she's negative. My son's positive, I'm positive. Mm -hmm. So how did you find out? I found out I was pregnant, so I went for a normal blood test for a pregnancy, and he'd done an HIV test on me. And I had to go back for another checkup to repeat the tests. So he checked, tested the children at the same time. My daughter negative, my son and my eye positive. I was more shocked than anything. Well, I can imagine you were. And what did your um? I mean, you weren't actually married to this man, but you had been living together for some time. I mean, when you confronted him... He said it wasn't his problem. It was my problem. I had to figure out what I wanted to do. So I came to say... I went down to Sydney, to the hospitals down there, and I've been coming back since. And he then left you, didn't he? Yes. And he, he married somebody else? He's married someone else. He has infected them two children as well. Plus, he's got another and one. And his wife? and his wife, plus he's got another one, little daughter running around also infected. So he's damaged three families. He certainly has. Do you think he knew what his responsibilities were? I mean, was he naive about this or was he being deliberately irresponsible? I suppose you've got a pretty jaundiced view of this. I'd say he was deliberately ignoring it because he didn't get help until the last minute when it was too late to be helped. So he, he basically just refused to accept himself that he was infectious, that if he was having sex with anybody else, he was going to be very likely to infect them. Yep. So what's your condition now? You're I'm HIV a, positive. I'm HIV, but I'm still asymptomatic. And what about your little boy? Well, he was asymptomatic until March this year. He's now age-related which is a big jump for a two-and-a-half-year-old. Peter O'Toole, how long have you been HIV positive? <coughs> um, I can tell you exactly the date I was diagnosed and what time, if you like. Mm. It was at 20 past 10 on February the 6th, 1984. So, so that was back in the years. early days? Yeah, eight years, getting on to eight years. So... And how did you get infected? Through sharing needles. Uh, well, what else? What, in 1984, I suppose, you didn't know what the risks were. There, w there was no public information around at the time about the risks uh, involved in sharing needles and syringes. Uh, 
only that it was a gay disease. Mm. And so you thought it had nothing to do with you, probably? Uh, no. One day, well, over a period of time, became sick with a fairly uh, strong bout of glands or fever and uh, went to my doctor at the time, who was a drug specialist or a drug rehab specialist. Mm. And amongst the tests that uh, he took, he decided to throw in a HIV test. He did tell me uh, that he was uh, testing for HIV, mm. but I had no and idea. And you thought, well, it's a routine yeah. thing, let him do it. Yeah, so you were shocked when he gave you the diagnosis. Two weeks later, I got a phone call from his secretary asking me to come back into the surgery. And when I hung up, I thought, you make appointments with doctors, don't you? They don't make mm. appointments with, with you. So I knew something was immediately wrong. But, mm. of course, I didn't want to believe that until he actually told me. Mm. Um, Lloyd Gross, you've been HIV positive for, um, what is it, about uh, eight years now? Eight years, um, about 1983. So you were very young when you were I diagnosed. I was 18, uh, just out of school. Possibly the, I think it was the third person I'd ever had sex with. It was, um, yeah, I, I um, as I said, very young. There was nothing known about it back then. We were still thinking it was a disease you caught in the bars of glasses, so we weren't going out. Mm. Um, and so no knowledge of, of, of any of that. Um, I was tested positive in 87, so there was a great deal of time in between um, that I had no idea. Since then, of course, I've been in you know, quite long relationship and so when I went for tests it was the, the testing site basically said that uh, I was in such a low risk they didn't really feel they wanted to test me um, I'm glad I got tested um, mm. Mm. what about some of the rest of you I mean there's such a wide range you Troy yes what about you I've had HIV positive for almost all of my life probably how, how many years is that um, How old are you next birthday? Six. That's six. In, it's in two weeks, isn't it? In two weeks. Yeah. And do you know what that means? You've been H being HIV positive for most of your life. I suppose it means lots of trips to the hospital. <laughs> yeah, you go to the hospital a lot, don't you? Yes. Mm. So Peter's asking you, what does it mean? What does it feel like? Well, not very good. No, I bet it doesn't. How many times have you? How many times, have you done a count on how many times you've been to hospital? Six oh. next birthday in your five and, a, five and three quarters years. How many, do you, have you kept a count on how many times you've been to hospital? Uh, Dad has if he hasn't. Yeah, how many times, Dad? <laughs> About 141 visits to the hospital we've had. That's a lot. 141 mm -hmm. visits to the hospital. Yep. But then I suppose that's an experience that you all share, isn't it? Absolutely. I can imagine what a shock it is when you're diagnosed and you're told that you're HIV positive. But I just wonder what it means to the people who are close to you. I mean, you've all had to tell parents, you've had to tell lovers, you've had to tell close friends. How have your parents dealt with it? Yeah. I mean, Kristen mm -hmm. Fay, what are you, you went through a difficult time yeah. with your parents, didn't you? I was initially um, contracted the virus in 83, diagnosed 84. Um, that's when we had all the media hype and stuff. I went straight to my family, I said, I've got AIDS, you know, and they just put up a, a wall. They mm -hmm. did not want to know. And um, then eventually when I became sick, um, I relied on them for help and stuff. And they couldn't deal with that either. They actually told people I have leukemia. Um, one thing's lucky, I've got a different surname to them. So any um, paper articles and stuff, it's still not associating with the family. And they were still, they're still still looking at it that way as well. That I, I don't have it, but I have it. That's how it's looked at. Yeah. And presumably it's affected your whole relationship with them? Uh, six months. Um, we didn't see each other for that time because I actually was asked to leave the house. Yeah. Um, well, because they didn't feel safe with you in the house or because basically. they didn't want you in the house? <coughs> Two. Uh, they didn't want me in the house <coughs> and, basic, and they also didn't feel safe. Um, they sort of rearranged a few things within the house. Um, they kept their con uh, distance from me as well and then ended, ended up leaving and then I invited myself to a family do and that's when things had to change and reverse and sort of come back to normal again but it was a very mm. hard six months what about is, is this a typical reaction 
What about the rest of you? Martin Berbelin. Well, you've got your mother with you, so obviously you have support from your mother. Yes, I've had great support from mum. Um, I was diagnosed in late 83 and worked it out to about 82. When I got diagnosed, basically because my friend had heard his friend, his earlier friend in the States had died, and it turned out to be AIDS after many months of hearing it was something else entirely. And in those days, we also believed that not everyone who was positive was going to get it. In fact, we mm. heard in those days that only about 10%. Mm. So when I told mum, I told that as well. And I don't think we ever And had you, a of course, immediately <laughs> wanted to believe that Martin would be part of the 90% that would never develop two hates. Well, I suppose that's a natural defensive reaction, isn't it? You, you do get a shock. And it comes home to you when one day I, was, I had a telephone call and it, I was told that he'd collapsed and was taken to the Fairfield Hospital. And that's when really the family um, sort of um, came realized. together and realised that it's, um, it's very serious and it's time we did something about it to help him all we can because he has a limited lifespan. Uh, maybe. Well, maybe. We're working Let's on the opposite. Go, <laughs> You're in there but fighting. I'm the, uh, forever an optimist, and we can always hope. <laughs> but I find it interesting, I mean, it seems to me, I don't know whether this is typical, but fathers find it harder to come to terms with than mothers. Is this uh, typical, or is this just some of the cases that are more obvious? It's typical. T tell us about your story, because well, Martin's not here to tell it anymore, is he? Martin's not here to tell it, no. And I was thinking about him when you were asking about the parents' reaction. I remember when Martin told us he was already he already had AIDS oh. he didn't know at any time that he was HIV infected um, and he had come home from Europe and he told us that he had AIDS and I thought that we took the news very well in our family um, but he told you didn't he he, told he didn't me. tell his father he didn't tell his father he told me and I asked him not to tell his father to allow me to tell his father which I did and his father, of course, handled the whole thing much better than I did and uh, had already suspected that something like this might be happening. And uh, What made you suspect that uh, he may have had AIDS, Ron? Well, we visited Martin in Europe in 1983 and uh, he had a boyfriend there mm. and I saw them looking at an article in a Dutch paper about AIDS, which was very new then. Mm. It was in Dutch, but I could recognise the word AIDS. I thought no more about it, but when we visited again in 85, he'd had a, a lot of problems with um, an abscess on his tooth that wouldn't heal, and things like that. Again, it didn't register, but when we got a message through his department where he worked that he was rushed to hospital with pneumonia, I was sure I knew what the trouble was. Mm. So you'd been quietly reading up about this without saying not, anything? No, not necessarily. I yes. just had seen these little things which meant nothing to me. But when we got the message that he was in hospital with pneumonia and was being sent back to Australia, I suspected the worst then. Mm. But I didn't know until Joan told me. So it, so it wasn't such a great shock to me. Mm. How do parents deal with this? Because it must be, I mean, uh, the shock for the person who's diagnosed is bad enough, but I imagine it's equally bad in a different sort of way for parents. I, I think the first moment when you hear the news, when you get the news that your son has AIDS, uh, that, that is the moment of your greatest grief, I mm. think. Mm. Most parents seem to feel that. And we mm. certainly felt that. And we were devastated and torn apart but Martin was a very smooth and sophisticated character indeed and he expected us to behave well and I felt we did. Oh. Uh, when he was about, I felt we behaved very well. But he when he did, wasn't around? He did a, a radio interview not long after he came home and uh, I listened to this radio interview and the woman who did the interview asked him how the family reacted and Martin said, well, I can't say they're totally relaxed. So <laughs> <laughs> but is this, I mean, because you did deal with it so well, I know you're asked to counsel lots of other parents who are struggling to deal with it. Is this a typical reaction? I mean, Kristen's parents just pushing him out of the house, A, because they're afraid, and B, because they're ashamed. 
other parents who blame themselves for what happens because they think they failed as parents? Is, are they typical? No, no, I wouldn't say that was typical, particularly of mothers. Mm. It depends, of course, uh, who the <coughs> dominant person in the house is. If the dominant person is the mother, then things generally go better. If the dominant person is the father, sometimes they go, don't go so well. The father does tend to blame himself often. Mm. Uh, he is also very furious on lots of occasions. He feels that this shouldn't happen in his family, that he's worked hard for for many years and tried to keep in good order. He doesn't like this sort of thing to have happened to his family. How do you cope yourself? I mean, yes. No. I'm, I'm a family therapist. I work at a centre called Bouverie where we see families uh, who are associated with HIV in some ways. And I think this is where how the family copes, where the social prejudice really creates an enormous block because right. the normal coping mechanisms of families would use of turning to their relatives, yeah. turning to Break their friends, down. the church, they can't use. They, because they feel so inhibited by the shame of AIDS that they just don't often use the support systems that uh, they would otherwise use, which then puts a, much more stress on the family themselves because it's like they have to keep this secret within their immediate family. Mm. And then they just don't get the supports that uh, they would use in, in any other situation. Mm. Yes, Peter O'Toole? Um, I was just picking up then on what uh, you were saying about the church. I found that that was particularly uh, apt in my family, uh, both my parents being uh, very strong Catholics and coming from a, a family that I was one of eight children, uh, I think they had a lot of trouble accepting it on a religious level. Uh, they could accept my drug use and so on and they pulled me through for the four years that they knew of that. Mm. But, it went but they just longer. could not. Within, when, the, within the limits of their religious faith, cope with you having well, AIDS? M well, my father is dead now. He died nearly mm. two years ago. Against all odds, I thought I'd be the first to go. But uh, he went, and my mother has had to deal with it uh, by herself since, of mm. course, with the help of the rest of the family. But she's only in the last week told our parish priest, which I'm tremendously glad that she's done because she does use the church a lot and mm. the priest for sol uh, solace mm. and for her to have done that after eight years is a big break for a step forward. Mm. Vince uh, Lovegrave, you've had to deal with this as a family, haven't you? We have, yes. We've, um, when, was, when was Susie <coughs> diagnosed? Susie was diagnosed in um, 84. Right. Um, and um, she died in 86. Um, and um, well, when, when, when she was first diagnosed, of course, it was a double header for us because, um, because she was a mother and she'd given birth to Troy. He, he was six months old at that stage. He had to be diagnosed as well as I did. As, as I did. Right. Um, and although my body is AIDS-free, um, I've actually been living with it with two members of my family for quite some time now, right. in fact, for, well, seven years. Um, but we were devastated. I mean... Um, what this lady said here about uh, the initial news about your child is, uh, and in, in my case, my wife, because I was sort of like an observer while I was involved, um, was true in that the initial grief was the worst um, and coming to grips with that. Coming, coming and the initial instinct is to keep it a secret. The initial instinct is to keep it a secret. I mean, we didn't tell anyone for 18 months. We, we just sat on it for 18 months, didn't tell a soul. And at the end of that time, um, when it was no longer possible for us to keep it a secret because of Susie's illness and because of Troy's illness at the right. same time and because of my mental stability, probably. Um, we started to tell friends. Um, and, um, and, and also because the other reason why is because I told some of my... Uh, I told my um, clients. I had a, a band management business right. at that stage and the clients who and I was told... that was the end of that? Yeah, well, I told them and um, I was greeted with probably the worst prejudice I've, I've oh. had. In fact, it was the most overwhelming prejudice. See, this is, this is a major problem, I think, for all of you who have AIDS or who have the HIV virus. It's a, it's a problem for you how your parents and the closest people to you are going to react to it. It might be useful here just to look at a little bit of what Susie Lovegrave herself had to say. And I mean, in a sense, this summarises what her reaction was when she contemplated the effect on her family. 
Can you remember what your fears and thoughts were when you were told that you had AIDS? Oh, Jesus. My mind went like a steam train. I mean, everything was working. Every gear was moving. I thought, first of all, well, I've killed my husband. I've killed my baby. I've killed his daughter. Anybody in my house is, like, contaminated. I mean... Oh, I just had the worst nightmares about everything. So this was obviously a big problem for her, apart from all the other problems she had to cope with. It was a huge problem for her. I mean, if, in fact, if, I mean, you know, I, I really wanted to tell people to ease myself out of the problem, but it was her insistence not to that, that, that I didn't because she just didn't feel that anyone else should suffer the way that she was suffering and that she felt everyone else was suffering. Uh, ironically, at the end of that period of time, when we kept it a secret, um, and we started to tell people, we of course went to the opposite extreme, the results of which, you, a portion of which you just saw, the film. Mm. We felt, bugger this, if this is the way everyone's gonna have to deal with it, then we've got nothing to lose, let's just tell everyone what it's like. Yeah, I guess and you were probably the first, really, to come out and make a major public statement about Well, that was the only this. way we could feel that we could deal with it any anymore, and we could help, and in her case, particularly to help <coughs> others, because it was, we definitely made the wrong move. It's definitely not the right way to go, is to keep it to yourself, mm. because you suffer further. Okay. How do the rest of you deal with this problem of the reaction of your parents and so on? Because this is obviously something that weighs heavily on you, is it? Well, I mean, one of the major reactions of my father was the fact that not only did I have to tell them I was HIV infected, I also had to tell them I was gay as well. Right. So there's a lot of people out there that are afraid to come out to tell their, their family that they're HIV infected because they also have to deal with the stigma right. that their family puts on them for being gay as well. So you've got a father and mother and family trying to, to cope with all sorts of things all at once. Right. So, um, you know, sort of the, the discrimination that happens, they sort of go, you're gay, well, you deserve it. Right. Or they say, um, then they try to deal with that for a while, and then you have to sort of let them process that. And then they try to process the sort of HIV infection. So mm. a lot of the discrimination that people with HIV face within families is because there's so much stigmatization on people that are gay as well. So sure. you've got to weigh up the two. So the, but the stigmatization mm. and so on that they're feeling, you obviously feel too, because, because they are the closest yeah. people to you in the world. You're going through the turmoil that they're going through. And you want their support, mm. and you want your friends' support, and you want your, your workplace for support, and you want you know, people around you to su support you. But if they're not going to support you because, one, because you're gay, and then two, because you're HIV infected, then you really feel isolated and you really feel alone out there. What about this question of discrimination? I mean, how how alive is this now? I mean, is this something of the past? I mean, do you still suffer stigmatization and discrimination because you say you're HIV, regardless of how you might have been infected? Here first. Uh, Peter, uh, I'm a social worker working in the area, and um, I would just like to say, yes, it's still very strong, unfortunately. Um, the number of clients that I have, I, I can even just quote a client this week who unfortunately has been given the sack, told to actually leave his workplace in the afternoon when he had no idea they even knew that he actually had the virus. Well, he actually um, has the AIDS now. And um, last week I had um, something like that as well. You, you even can have um, the other side where, for example, there are many situations where Social Security with someone who actually is healthy, asymptomatic, Social Security might be encouraging them to go on the invalid pension, basically like giving up. Mm. Um, when the person is wanting to Even work there and quite keep working, fit quite and fit well and, 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 and still productive, and wanting to actually get on with life mm. and concentrate on their quality of life. Well, Robert, Robert Shearer, tell us your experience. Yes, Robert, tell us your experience because these are people who should know better. You're dealing with health professionals here in your case, aren't you? Tell us your experience. Well, basically, um, in a lot of cases that people have said tonight, <laughs> it is very hard to tell someone else, say hypothetically yourself, that you are HIV positive. Mm. Uh, that alone is enough for anyone to cope with. Um, in the health profession myself, uh, such as the dental hospital, uh, where I had had treatment a number of times over the years uh, through taking a um, referral to the dental hospital itself, there are people who still panic within the hospital who are doctors, nurses, dental technicians, who find that very hard to cope with. So you do the right thing and point out that you're HIV positive yes. so they can take all the precautions they may well, want to take. you have to. But tell us about the reaction of one of the uh, dentists who was working with you. Well, basically the dentist who was performing the work 
um, my mouth was numb at the time for having um, an extraction. And of course, um, he had his staff around him and while I was sitting in the chair, the dentist turned around and said, look, stand, stand back from this person. He's HIV infectious. He has the AIDS virus. Don't get any blood on you and um, in case you catch AIDS. And basically, he didn't want to perform the work because um, he turned around and said, it's pointless performing an, an extraction, uh, following up with work on your teeth because of... Um, sorry. Couldn't be around. Yeah, because you're not going to be around. Because I wouldn't be around long. Uh. Which I thought was absolutely disgusting. Uh. It wouldn't make you feel great. Well, Andrew Morgan, tell us about your experience just trying to get a flat. Um, and I'll also reiterate that I had a client, I worked for the AIDS Council of New South Wales mm. last week, who was given a set of ill-fitting dentures, who was asymptomatic but HIV positive three weeks ago. Uh, when he complained about his ill-fitting dentures, he was told by his dental, uh, dentist... No at point the dental wasting good money on you, you're um, not going to be around. He had to put up with them because he wouldn't need them for a very long time anyway. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, as an actual fact, I mean, many of you have been around HIV positive for eight and nine years, haven't you? Mm. Yeah, right. Um, when I was diagnosed in 1985, I went through a great deal of distress and it was suggested by my employer um, that perhaps I needed a lot of time off right now and I should find another job after I'd got over this diagnosis, um, where it was my wish at the time to continue work. Um, and last week, I mean, it's still happening, this is 1991 and things should be different but because there's been no essentially effective education campaigns for people with HIV. Um, I applied for housing last week through a real estate agent to rent a house. I had my partner with me who was um, also looking at the houses, who is a visually ill man now. His uh, symptoms are such that you can tell he's been experiencing mm. some sort of illness. When I filled out my application form, my place of employment is the AIDS Council of New South Wales. Um, I rang to see if we had been given the house and the real estate agent told me that none of my references actually checked out. His reference to place who I was in his mind was you're the man from the AIDS council with the sick friend aren't you um, when I checked my references none of them had actually been rung um, and I know that my references do check out I mean this public fear is basically uh, built on <coughs> ignorance isn't it I mean Absolutely. first of all the assumption that if you're HIV positive well you're going to be incapable of doing anything that's it you're as good as dead Yes, Keith. Another problem we have, of course, is the way the media reports AIDS. And at present, we've had sensationalism all the time in reporting of people living with the virus. And it's been very difficult to live positively with AIDS when, in fact, the media are, in fact, giving horrendous stories of and controversial stories against people. And well, that, you, what, can you give us an example? I mean, you talk about the tabloids here, because I thought most of the broadsheets in Australia had been pretty responsible about their reporting. I would think it? mainly in the TV media, um, mm. the Charlene case and other cases, mm. the sensational, uh, the police officer be getting uh, attacked by some of the syringe. And basically, they're very hard for us to live positively when, in fact, the media is stereotyping us in certain ways. And that really stops you fighting in some ways when the media report not the pain, not the courage and the contribution of people living with the virus. Yeah, so this is, this is clearly a problem, the, the stereotyping that people automatically do. If you say you're HIV positive, they're immediately saying, is that person homosexual? Are they a drug user? Are they a prostitute? Michelle, um, what's your uh, experience with um, public reactions? I've been infected since 82 and I've known since early 85. Um, I was, had mass discrimination initially because I was the first woman in South Australia to be diagnosed um, to the point where I was banned from a courtroom because I'd infect everybody in there and um, <laughs> banned from a jail. I mean, it was just terrific. Well, um, what, do you find people well, with I, I either, either in morbid curiosity about how you got infected or even just assuming that you're a prostitute or a drug user or a homosexual <laughs> of some sort? Or? Yeah, I actually refuse to answer it. Um, women women are asked how they got infected. Men are presumed, their sexuality is presumed and I don't oh. know what's worse. I don't think it matters. If you've got this virus, you've got it. You learn to live with it. It doesn't matter how you got it. And it leads into that whole thing. They're, in, you know, medically acquired, are quite innocent, and we're guilty, and I won't wear that. Oh. We're all innocent. So you That's find right. that the public does yeah, tend to deal... <laughs> so you find that the public does tend to deal more sympathetically with people who they can feel, uh, well, what about IV drug users? I mean, I I anyone who's not homosexual is dealt with more sympathetically. Is that right? Or? No, not at all. Not, not? <laughs> not at all. No? Right. Um, <laughs> IV drug users, I think, have been discriminated against for as long as homosexuals have. Mm. 
mm. uh, because, well, for longer actually, because homosexuality in Victoria has been legalised or de decriminalised, whereas IV drug use hasn't, uh, and probably won't for a long time, regardless of what Carl Glare has said. And what do you feel I'm just interested though, Peter, do you feel obliged to tell people how you got infected <coughs> because that obliged. affects their reaction? I don't feel obliged, but I don't like being presumed to be gay. I find I had enough of that when I was a hairdresser. Mm. <laughs> you're, if you're a, hair, a no, male but why hairdresser, is that? That, that sort of presupposes that you do get a harder time if you're well, gay. Well, you're, you're gay until proven innocent mm. or proven otherwise, you know. Um, and in my case, I had to prove otherwise by letting people know that I was a drug user and that's how I caught it. Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're gay or not or whether you've used drugs or whether you're a haemophiliac. I think if compensation is meant to be given to anyone, it should be to all of us, or none, none at all. Mm. John Walden, tell us about your experience. Uh, you've certainly been through the mill, haven't you? Oh, just a little bit. Yeah. I was diagnosed in early 86, and uh, uh, self-destruct like most of us have been through, you know, two years, and uh, I was drinking a lot and just trying to cope with the virus yeah. itself. And two years later, I woke up and thought, hang on, why aren't I dead yet, you know? Mm. So I decided to travel up north. Uh, I found this nice little place, Cardwell, up in northern Queensland, and uh, there was a knock on my door, and the police come in and started searching my place for drugs, you know? I used to drink down the pub a bit. I don't know, they must have thought I was a drug dealer mm. or something. Were you a user? Yes, mm. that's how I got the virus, mm. yeah. But uh, I had no drugs, uh, and uh, they went through my wallet and they said, "How come you're on sickness benefits?" You know, and I said, "I'm HIV," and they said, "What?" And uh, I said, "AIDS." Well, they stopped searching and left straight away. <laughs> <laughs> Gone, and uh, which I thought was pretty good because I didn't mess the place up too much. <laughs> and. Uh, but the next day, I had mothers knocking on my door saying, how come you're living here? I've got children running around and you've got AIDS. Now, I only told one person. That was, that was a policeman. policeman. You know? So you thought would respect my your confidentiality confidence. was blown straight out the window. I went down that day to the pub to have a beer and as I'm walking down the street, everyone crossed the road or, or, or went into a shop. So I had a clear way straight to the pub, you know? <laughs> and um, didn't have to speak to anyone, which was good. Went into the pub, and uh, the publican didn't serve me, but a barman did, and went out to the beer garden, had half of me pot, I, I drank half, and the publican come out and said, uh, you've got AIDS, grabbed me glass, took it over to the cigarette ashtray and smashed it, and told me to get out, you know. So I thought, oh, this is good, you know. Went back to the caravan park where I was staying and the owner spotted me walking in and said grab your gear and go you know and I'd had it by this stage you know and so I was going did. anyway look believe mm. me I was going so I rang the policeman and I said what well, what are you doing you know and uh, he said well you've got AIDS I said so what you told the whole town you know you've, you're gonna have problems you mm. know and they did. They had a lot of problems here. Like three years later, there was meant to have been 300 people infected with the virus, you know, and and I was the one, and you know, like, it was full on. Yeah. Yeah. You you were seen as the man who'd infected half the population of well, Cardwell. Three hundred. I was meant to inf infect 300 women. Now <laughs> I was only there six weeks. <laughs> And I've worked it out to be well, about seven and nine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and is Cardwell still panic-stricken? Oh, no, they had T-shirts written. It was amazing. The Tourist Bureau were making a lot of money out of it. <laughs> I wanted a cut. They had these T-shirts that said, um, the ac uh, if the Axemen don't get your AIDS will, and the Axemen were a local football team. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, I've got to have one of them T-shirts. <laughs> Vince, have you had any problems with Troy? I mean, has, well, no, I must say, child... I mean, listen, listening to all this, I can relate to it all because I have experienced um, um, degrees of prejudice and very heavily so. And because there was nobody who could counsel us as to what to do, we basically, we being Troy and I, 
um, confronted these situations in consultation with Troy's doctor, Dr. Ziegler, who came in after I, I mm. belted the doors in. But we actually confronted the people that I went to in terms of the preschool and in terms of the school um, this year and went to them when I made the applications and told them straight off the bat that he was HIV positive. And what um, was the reaction? <coughs> well, the reaction when we first applied to the preschools, um, I applied to six preschools um, and in the application form there's a section that uh, refers to health and each one of them I put HIV positive so that they couldn't turn around afterwards and say that we were trying to hide it mm. um, and I put in brackets just in case they weren't uh, didn't weren't uh, familiar with the term HIV I put AIDS and um, we got a reply back from um, three of them three of them we didn't get a reply back at all um, two of those three phoned back and said that they were full um, when I knew they weren't mm. I knew they weren't full but we did get a reply back from one which was in Randwick and um, they were fantastic mainly through to through the um, bravery of the principal at that stage mm. We then went to Coogee Public, which is where he started this year, and they were just fantastic. We went, mm. I went to the headmaster there. The headmaster was great. He wanted to be educated. Um, he passed that want on to the teachers. They were all supportive. We had a public meeting with all the parents of the uh, people at school. Once again, we weren't obligated to, but we felt that we had to because we mm. knew we were getting somewhere. We and it was all okay. We confronted with them with it. It was not only all okay, but the community, uh, the word spread um, in that community, and we've been really supported. Troy in particular right. has been supported by the parents, by the teachers. Well, tell, tell us about it, Troy. I mean, your mates all know that you're HIV positive, do they? Yes. Yeah? Do they know what that means? Um, not really. No. Do you, do you try and explain to them? Yes. Yeah? How do you explain to them? How would you um, explain to me about it? I tell them that I got them from my mum. Mm -hmm. Um... You tell them they shouldn't be afraid of you? They wouldn't be scared of you, would they? No. No. Do they ever ask you about you dying or anything like that? Mm. Do you think about it, though, sometimes, don't you? Because you know what happens, yes. what can happen. Mm. And what do you say to them? Um, they don't necessarily think about me dying or... They don't? No. Well, that's good. Because if you're thinking about it, you don't want them thinking about it, too. One's enough, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That makes the point that one of the sort of the popular misconceptions that makes it very difficult for people to cope in families, for instance, is this notion that HIV positive equals imminent death. You know, that once yeah. you're, you're HIV positive, therefore you have AIDS, therefore you're going to die soon. And I guess what you're hearing from here is a lot of people where there is an enormously long period of being HIV positive and being healthy. And even after an AIDS diagnosis, that doesn't mean it's a downhill course. And that's, I think, if we can get anything across that, you know, to change the perceptions, would be that notion that being HIV positive doesn't mean you're about to die. You know, it mm. means you might have quite a long life ahead of you mm. and quite healthy. As a matter of interest, what is the longest? I, I was saying before eight years. We have, I know, several people here who've been HIV positive for eight years and are still perfectly fit. Anybody longer than eight years? I get ten years next month. Ten years next it. month? Yeah. And how's you, are you still working? Uh, sometimes, yeah, when I'm <laughs> at my desk. <laughs> yeah, I'm working full time, my health is fine. Right. Yes, somebody up the back wanted to make a point. Uh, I'd just like to say that health professionals also do experience some discrimination. Mm. And when I first, I uh, work as a nurse. In, in an AIDS ward, obviously. Yes. yes. And when I first started in 86, it was a fairly new disease in Australia still. And certainly with my family, I know there was an enormous amount of concern, or there was no actual discrimination, but there was uh, some concern about me going to work in an AIDS ward. And certainly where I was previously working, um, when I had resigned from my position there, and people obviously asked you where you're going to go, and I told them I was going to go and look after people with AIDS. Well, the response was not, oh, that'll be interesting or how exciting. What an interesting way to commit suicide, I suppose, was the reaction. Attitude of like, well, why would you want to do something like that? Mm and it was very negative. Well, what do you do to change the public perceptions of AIDS and especially people who are HIV positive? What do you do? Because from what you've explained here, a lot of it is based on fear and ignorance rather than prejudice. Is that right? It's based on a sense of other. 
that it's a bit like the stuff with, with gay men and women. There's hundreds of thousands in Australia, but they're no one's children or brothers and sisters or neighbours. Now, right. we're hearing about the stories of discrimination here, but because of the, the trouble with, with secrecy and silence, no one in our community owns that they have uh, neighbours or workmates or friends with, with HIV. Therefore, it can be kept at a distance. Now, I can go down Swanson Street and, and from a tram window see people all the time whose lives have been hit by AIDS because I work in the area. Yeah. But I know that no one in their world knows it. What we need is, is people like yourself to talk about friends you have or yeah. a, a Prime Minister, whoever it might be, to cry on television because his, his, <laughs> one of his close people has AIDS. We have Princess Di hugging babies in, in London. Fantastic stuff. Yeah. Well, I suppose and that sort of business. I suppose the fact that all of you have been prepared to come forward with names, mm. faces, uh, in a quite unembarrassed way is yes, at least a first step yes, because yes. this sort of thing is not done. People who are HIV positive or who have AIDS tend to be seen behind a black screen or with false names or mm. in some form of disguise. But yes, you were going to suggest something? Well, just personally for me, the one way I found it was the most effective for combating all the problems of living with AIDS was to, just to learn how to fight back. And there's so many things that we have to unite and fight back against. Um, for instance, the amount of drugs that are available in Australia that um, aren't available here, as opposed mm. to that are available in other parts of the world. Um, get, I, I'm personally involved in ACT UP and I find that very, very therapeutic because I feel as though I'm doing something mm. to try to get drugs available in, in Australia. Mm. Jane Maloney, what do you think needs to be done to change the public perceptions? I mean, have you... They need to be educated. Mm. Badly. Mm. But but we've already got massive public education But they don't listen campaigns. to that. Are they, they not, are they not working? No, they need to be educated by the ones that are suffering with it. Grim, grim reaper ads. I mean, I think the biggest, the, the biggest form of, um, the biggest cause of discrimination in this country at the moment is that the, um, the government's decided to put together this grim, grim reaper ad in 85, and all of a sudden everyone's going, oh, you're, walking, you're the walking dead, you're death. You know, mm. a person with HIV is death. And that's the way we were pictured. We weren't pictured living with the virus, we weren't pictured doing things that everyone else does. We were pictured as death that was going to bowl over their families. Mm. This is a government funded campaign from the Commonwealth Department of Community Services and Health and the Grim Reaper in 85 pictured us as, as you say, as transmitters of death. Um, the AIDS educators in this country don't do AIDS education, they do transmission. They teach the rest of the country to protect them, some, themselves from us, the infected. Mm. Mm. Last year's campaign trans, um, <coughs> portrayed us as people with blacked out faces, electronically mosaic voice in fabulous luppy, uh, yuppie interiors. Now in you were made even more exotic. <coughs> yes. And we still didn't have faces. Where are the campaigns that show the people with HIV in this country that have been working in AIDS since 1981, 1982, 1983, have been supporting and educating their own communities, are leading very heroic lives and are dying very dignified deaths? Where are those campaigns that show the rest of Australia that we need education, drug treatments, support and care? Not that they need to be afraid of us and protect themselves from us. Sure. Our own See, Department of Health is responsible. Um, well, I know a number of states are toughening up their anti-discrimination laws to give more protection to people who are HIV positive or have, who have AIDS, but it seems to me that even that is pointless if the public is afraid of you. Uh, uh, how do you overcome the public fear? A lot of the people here are themselves walking anti-discrimination uh, symbols because they're on care teams, they explain to people what they're doing, people say, why on earth are you doing that? They mm. explain carefully and that is an education. So bit by bit, That's right. you and are helping to... I'm proud to... to be part of a joint thing with churches and the uh, AIDS Council uh, working together to provide people to help on s support teams and I think that's an excellent education. Mm. Mm. Michelle, yes, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, I've been open about my status and not behind black screens since 1985 mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of courage, it's taken a lot of courage for a lot of people to be here tonight. Mm. Um, the only thing and I think the most important thing that's going to change what Australia or the rest of the world feels about HIV is people coming out and saying yes we have HIV you know we're here we're not going to hurt you um, exactly and the yeah. discrimination has just gone like I, I've noticed it in me um, the discrimination I get now if I get any is very little and I'm quite able to handle it Yes, and, but how, how do you persuade you people that they don't need to be afraid of you? Because all, as someone pointed out here, all the public education campaigns are basically saying to the wider public, hands off, 
Educate. I do well, it every day. Yeah. I've been doing education with people since 85, and I still do it, and so do a lot of people here. Just continual education by people with HIV. Mm. Is it the back you want to say something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say something. I also work with AIDS patients. I'm a nurse. And um, I understand what everybody's saying. And one of the biggest problems I find is when I talk to other nurses from other hospitals, they say, where do you work? And you say, I work at Fairfield. And they automatically take three steps back mm. from you and they say, mm. well, what do you do? Do you wear gowns? Do you wear gloves? Do you do this? Do you do that? And when you say to them, what are you talking about? No, we don't. They have this... Even professionals who are educated and should know what they're talking about are prejudiced against people with HIV. And it's very difficult to put across to people who should know what they're doing that they're totally way out of line and they've got no idea what they're doing either. And um, I think it's an enormous problem and I find it really difficult to get across to other professional health people who mm. should know what they're doing. But presumably you do take sensible precautions. Oh, you take precautions absolutely. to ensure that you have no contact with the blood absolutely. of the I'm people you're about, working with, the body uh, fluids. I'm talking about people. I've been in other hospitals and visited patients in other major public hospitals and I'll be sitting there talking to them and I'll see somebody walk through the door who's got a gown on and a pair of gloves and a pair of goggles and a mask mm -hmm. and they're changing the water jug <laughs> and they're, um, <laughs> they're picking up a bottle and taking a bottle up out and they're taking a temperature. And I actually had an experience once where the fellow I was visiting said, um, this girl works at Fairfield. And they said, oh, yes. And he said, you should ask them what they do. And they said, um, oh, you know, I suppose you wear all this stuff too, don't you? And I said, no, I don't. I said, I might wash my hands at the end of it. I said, but I don't wear all that rubbish. And they were just totally astounded that people, that we would walk in and touch these people and not have a pair of gloves on and stuff like that. I think it's very much up to people like us to do things like we're doing tonight and to do it in every phase of our lives. I, I go out and speak to groups of people everywhere, whoever asks me, because I like to imagine that I look like everybody's mother or everybody's <laughs> grandmother or everybody's aunt. And people do begin to realise when they see ordinary people who've been affected that they could also be affected. And it mm. does make them more sympathetic, there's no doubt about it. Mm. Could we, um, and we're running close to the end of our time here, I'm just interested in how all of you cope. We talked about your families, we've talked about the problems with the wider public. How do the rest, Martin Burbling, how do you deal with it? Because you well, seem to me to have a very positive attitude. Yeah, basically I tend to deal with it by being an absolute nut. It doesn't mean to say that there aren't moments when I just, like, I'm so depressed that I say, look, why doesn't it just come and get me and please get it over with? But um, actually when Mum said earlier that the first time she dealt with it was when I collapsed at the factory, it was actually when I was standing there watching a printing machine and there was this two-way conversation in my head, one saying, look, it's not worth it, kill yourself. The other one, no, I've, you know... Mm. And that was basically why I collapsed. It was so intense and that from then on, it was a gradual build-up of answering all the questions from both sides, from both, you know, whatever can happen either side, if I live, if I die. I'm happy with all the answers. And now I've got peace. It's great. Mm. That's how I deal with it. Yes. Um, how I cope with it is um, I fight back. Mm. I, um, I do everything I can to, um, to make sure <coughs> that if I do get sick, that I've got the treatments available for me. I, um, I march, I demonstrate, I scream, I yell, I write articles, I do newspaper interviews, we do radio interviews, we organize bars, clubs into this country. We try to get the government to allow us to cope. Mm. And that's what we have to do, you know. We have to sit there and we have to make the government allow us to cope. Well, I'm glad you're all still fighting. If you Positive. weren't still fighting, you wouldn't be here tonight. And I do appreciate what you've done to come here and talk about yourselves in such a, a frank and very personal way. And I hope you've achieved at least something by doing it all. Thank you very much, and we'll be back next Wednesday night. Good night until then. <coughs> <coughs> A bit of uh, ignorance to be lifted. I would like for people to stop pushing the panic button. It's, it's nothing I'm going to be able to give to them. 
It's something I and I alone endure. And uh, the prejudice and the ignorance, they're very much of what I'd like to kind of relieve. <laughs>